This program is supported in part by a grant from the BNSF Railway Foundation, dedicated to improving the general welfare and quality of life in communities throughout the BNSF Railway Service Area. Proud to support Wyoming PBS. By a grant from AARP, serving the needs and providing real possibilities for the over 50 population in Wyoming. AARP Wyoming. Proud to support Wyoming PBS. And by Wyoming Humanities, celebrating our heritage, strengthening our democracy, and growing Wyoming's creative and cultural economy for over 50 years. Visit thinkwhy.org. Good morning and welcome to Capital Outlook and Wyoming PBS's live coverage of Governor Mark Gordon's State of the State Address and also Wyoming Supreme Court Chief Justice Michael Davis's State of the Judiciary Address. I'm Craig Blumenshine, Senior Public Affairs Producer at Wyoming PBS, and this is a special day in the history of Wyoming State Capitol, which was celebrated and reopened to the public on Wyoming Statehood Day this past July 10th after more than four years of renovation. Today, Governor Gordon will give his second State of the State Address, but his first back in the newly restored and, quite frankly, beautiful Wyoming State Capitol. A joint session of the 65th Wyoming Legislature will be convened by Senate, Senate President Drew Perkins soon, and Governor Gordon and his wife, Wyoming's First Lady Jenny Gordon, will be escorted into the House Chambers of the Wyoming Capitol by Senator Wendy Schuler and Speaker Pro Temp of the House of Representatives Albert Summers and House Majority Floor Leader Eric Barlow. <clears throat> The governor will likely speak about his budget, which he describes as flat, the need to work on carbon net negative power generation technologies, and the need for Wyoming's community colleges and the University of Wyoming to better organize Wyoming's post-secondary educational opportunities. The joint session of the 65th Wyoming Legislature budget session will please come to order. Senator Schuler, Representatives Barlow and Summers will escort the First Lady of Wyoming, Jenny Gordon, and His Excellency the Governor, Mark Gordon, to this joint session. While we await their arrival, I ask that you would stand with me and the Speaker and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. While we await their arrival, uh, we'll just stand, this body will stand at ease to the sound of the gavel. The next sound. And, of course, we um, will await Governor Gordon's address. He'll likely also continue to show his support for Wyoming's tourism industry. And he will report to the Wyoming legislature and to the citizens of Wyoming that the state of the state and the state of Wyoming's economy is strong. This is in spite of looming concerns about mineral industry revenue downturns and, of course, how Wyoming will fund its K-12 education in the future. Also on hand today will be Wyoming's other top elected officials, including Secretary of State Ed Buchanan, State Treasurer Kurt Meyer, the State Superintendent of Public Instruction Jillian Balo, and Wyoming State Auditor Christy Racinas. Also, members of the Wyoming Su Supreme Court will be in attendance today, as well as United States District Judges for the District of Wyoming and the Chief Magistrate Judge for the District of Wyoming. This is also an important day for Wyoming PBS as we broadcast for the first time from a remodeled studio area off the connector in the garden level of the Capitol Complex. <clears throat> we'll be broadcasting episodes of Capital Outlook live from our new studio each Friday at 7.30 p.m. for the next five weeks. And we invite you to join us as we visit with key members from both the House and the Senate of the Wyoming Legislature to keep you up to date and informed with the happenings in this 2020 budget session. It's worth noting that for the first time in recent memory, memory the Legislature will have on its desk the budget bill, day one, due largely to the efforts of the Joint Appropriations Committee chaired by Senator Eli Bebout and Representative Bob Nicholas. Both Senator Bebout and Representative Nicholas will be with us as our guests this coming Friday on Capital Outlook. Other key issues that will certainly also grab some oxygen here in the Capitol this session 
include whether Wyoming will expand Medicaid coverage, as 37 other states have done under the guidelines of the Affordable Care Act. It would allow approximately 19,000 Wyomingites to have insurance that they don't have today. The question is, how will Wyoming pay for what will be a 10 percent state match that would Mr. be required? Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, it is my pleasure to announce the following guests. The Honorable Kelly Rankin, Chief United States Magistrate Judge for the District of Wyoming, escorted by Senator Garou and Representatives Walters and Swanizer. Thank you. All rise. The Honorable Alan Johnson, United States District Judge for the District of Wyoming, escorted by Senator Kinski and Representatives Eklund and Miller. The Honorable Scott Scabdahl, Chief United States District Judge for the District of Wyoming, escorted by Senator Baldwin and Representatives Hallinan and McGuire. The Honorable Carrie Gray, Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court, escorted by Senator Wasserberger and Representatives Washett and Blake. The Honorable Lynn Boomgarden, Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court, escorted by Senator Pappas and Representatives Paxton and Duncan. legislators, elected officials, and those Wyomingites who are here today are very pleased, certainly, to be back in the Capitol, what many call the most important building in Wyoming, and that's where we'll take you now to see the sights and hear the sounds as we await Governor Mark Gordon as he prepares to, prepares to deliver his State of the State address before the joint session of the Wyoming Legislature. I'm Craig Blumenschein reporting for Wyoming PBS. We hope you enjoy our coverage. Honorable Kate Fox, Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court, escorted by Senator Beitman and Representative Sweeney and Simpson. <laughs> the Honorable Jillian Balo, State Superintendent of Public Instruction, escorted by Senator Hutchings and Representatives Northrop and Freeman. <laughs> the Honorable Kurt Meyer, State Treasurer, escorted by Senator Steinmetz and Representatives Burkhart and Flitner. Christy J. Racinas, State Auditor, escorted by Senator Anselmi Dalton and Representatives Schwartz and Lloyd Larson. Edward Buchanan, Secretary of State, escorted by Senator Ellis and Representatives Hunt and Laux. The Honorable Michael K. Davis, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Wyoming, escorted by Senator Nethercott and Representatives Crank and Nicholas.
First Lady of Wyoming, Jenny Gordon, and His Excellency, the Governor of the State of Wyoming, Mark Gordon, escorted by Senator Schuler and Representatives Barlow and Summers. Thank you very much. I would now like to invite Reverend Thomas Cronkleton, pastor of the Church of Holy Trinity here in Cheyenne, to give the invocation. Please remain standing while he does that for us. Let us pray. Lord God, after four years of absence from the hallowed halls of this Capitol building, and after all the work that was done to remodel, restore, and refurbish this building and the whole complex, we rejoice to return to the rightful home of the Wyoming legislature. Be with our senators, our representatives, our elected officials, the members of the judiciary, and the personnel who assist them so that they may be good stewards of all that you have entrusted them. This budget session of the 65th Wyoming Legislature presents many opportunities and challenges as the revenues and expenditures of the next biennium are determined and as educational, health care, and other needs of our great state are addressed. King Solomon, when he succeeded his father David, prayed, Give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people and to distinguish right from wrong. Lord God, therefore, blessed him with a heart so wise and understanding that there was no one like him and no one his equal. May our leaders be as humble as Solomon and as equally blessed. As we now listen to Governor, Sub Governor Gordon share with us the state of the state and Chief Justice Davis share with us the state of the judiciary, let us thoughtfully consider the challenges and opportunities before us so that with your divine grace and assistance, we may together fulfill the responsibility to govern wisely and well. We ask all this and all things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Reverend Cronkleton. Members of the 65th Le Legislature, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I present you with His Excellency, the Governor, Mark Gordon. Governor? <laughs>
Thank you. It's amazing to be here. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you for that prayer. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much. Take a good seat. This is only three and a half hours long. <laughs> oh, thank you. President Perkins, Speaker Harshman, and members of the 65th Legislature, thank you for your welcome. To the people of Wyoming here and those watching at home, good morning. And I also want to welcome Secretary of State Ed Buchanan, Auditor Christy Racinus, Treasurer Kurt Meyer, and Superintendent Bailo. Together, we have addressed many tough issues this year, always crafting sensible, workable solutions to even the most challenging of the, some of, the facing, of the, those facing our state, communities, large and small, and I thank you for your work. We are honored this morning with the presence of Supreme Court Chief Justice Davis and Justices Coutts, Fox, Bloomgarden, and Gray. Thank you for your wise consideration of perplexing issues and your appropriate application of the law. And I'm really pleased to have Lee Spoonhunter, Chairman of the Northern Arapaho Business Council with us today. And although unfortunately travel conditions prevented Karen Snyder, Vice Chair of the Eastern Shoshone Business Council from being here, I would like you to join me in welcoming them to this, to this chamber. We are friends, and I've enjoyed building our relationships this year. And I look forward to the progress that we will make in the year ahead. Our peoples and our governments deserve our very best efforts, and I know that we will jointly work on that. I want to thank Secretary Buchanan and his team for his partnership with the tribes to advance a good proposal so that tribal IDs can be used for voter registration. I really, this is one of the great honors that you have in an address like this, and I couldn't be more pleased to welcome Captain Scott Koenig to the chamber. Captain Koenig is a Wyoming native who, along with 29 other soldiers, recently returned from Afghanistan. He and other members of the 3rd Platoon of Charlie Company left last January on a challenging mission to provide 24-hour aeromedical evacuation coverage in Helmand Province. Captain Koenig, welcome home to Wyoming and know that we are so proud of you and the talented and brave members of your team, and I want to congratulate you for receiving an Air Medal and a Combat Action Badge. Captain Koenig is up in the gallery. Hey! glad you are home. Adjutant General Porter couldn't be here today, but taking his place is Command Sergeant Major Harold Pafford. And I thank him for his many years of leadership and service to the state. There is Command Sergeant Major Pafford. As the general is fond of saying, 
Our guard is the sword and the shield, our nation's lethal fighting force when necessary, and the folks who keep us safe from fire, flood, and other natural catastrophes. A little story here. General Porter, Command Sergeant Pafford, and I accompanied the First Lady to enjoy Thanksgiving with men and women overseas. Jenny grew up in a military family and knows well that any deployment is not easy. Not easy because our Army and Air Guard are away from the folks that they love and away from those that love them. So I want you again to rise and please join me in saluting our men and women and their families for being the sword and the shield. And let's keep in our thoughts. And let's keep in our thoughts all members of the military serving overseas and at home. We thank you and we thank the many veterans who have defended our nation. You know what? I'm especially proud of Jenny. Clearly, I married above myself. As First Lady, she established the nationally recognized Wyoming Hunger Initiative one that is so critically important to the so many, the many kids in our state. And true to form, she's done it by lifting up the extraordinary efforts of many working around the state to address food insecurity. She's making it happen while keeping our ranch running, supporting our family, and loving every moment of being a grandmother to Everett. My equal in every way, she is the epitome of a Wyoming woman, accomplished, strong, versatile, independent, caring, talented, funny, warm, and a lover of the great outdoors. Jenny, my respect for you is absolute, and my love for you is boundless. Let us respect all women, all Wyoming women, by working to live up to our motto, we are the equality state. I want to thank Sarah and Spencer up there for being here. Your son, our grandson, represents the future generations of this state. Everett isn't here today, but his other grandparents, Mark and Shelley Fagan, are. Everett's apparently busy studying for an ag econ degree with his toy tractor, <laughs> his horses, his cows, and his sheep. Finally, on behalf of the citizens of Wyoming, I want to sincerely thank the members of the 65th Legislature for your willingness to serve and your commitment to this great state. These are not easy times, and there will be hard choices to make, but I enjoy our work together. And I respect and value your thoughts, and I look forward to facing our common future together. I ask all guests here to join me in applauding our state legislature. Hey! Before moving on to the progress we've made and the issues we face, I want to offer a few thoughts on this magnificent building. To quote you, Mr. Speaker, from Statehood Day last summer, look around you. 
Take in this place. Take a moment to appreciate it and the history that has happened here. And a lot has happened in this building this past year, culminating on December 10th when we honored women, the woman's, Wyoming woman's heritage as the first government to recognize the woman's vote. And before I recognize the good men and women who worked to bring this effort to fruition, Jenny and I want to present you, Mr. President, and you, Mr. Speaker, the first flags that have flown over your chambers. Just to let you know how this came about, we couldn't fly either flag on Statehood Day last summer because the hardware was broken. Consultants projected it might cost thousands of dollars to repair because scaffolding had been removed. Jane Mockler pointed this out to me. In fact, it really didn't look like we would be able to fly the flags today. But Tommy Ojeda and his phenomenal crew landed on a way to fix that whole thing for around 300 bucks. That is the dedication and ingenuity of our state workforce. Now let me recognize the members of the original Capital Oversight Committee, some of whom are here. Senator Eli Bebout, Chris Rothfuss, Jane Mockler, Phil Nicholas, the Honorable Tony Ross, Representatives Kermit Brown, Rosie Berger, Tim Stubson, Mary Throne, who could not be here today, Pete Illaway, and especially Governor Mead. Would you please rise? Thank you so much for your work. Thank you all for your dedication to this effort, for persevering through a long project. And I also want to recognize Mr. David Hart of MOCA Systems, who must be thanked for his work in getting this project on track, and thankfully also for keeping that oversight committee in line. Mr. David Hart, would you please stand so we can recognize you. And lastly, I hope you will thank me in joining the craftsmen and women whose care is evident everywhere you look in this building. So now to the business at hand. Today I am proud to report that the state of Wyoming is strong. We are strong because more people are finding a better future for our state. Our population has grown. Unemployment is down at its lowest rate since 2008. Gross national product is increasing. Gross domestic product is increasing. Personal income is up. up. And despite some obvious challenges this year, our economy remains strong. We're strong thanks to our people. We're strong because we have planned well for challenging times. And we're strong because of our industries, energy, tourism, agriculture, and the emerging sectors of knowledge-based business and manufacturing. 
And I am confident that we will remain strong by aggressively engaging our future and seizing our opportunities. Thanks to the wisdom of our forebears, some in this very room, and the leadership of an extraordinary group of governors and treasurers, including Treasurer Meyer, Wyoming finds itself in an enviable place amongst our peers. We have savings. This means we have time, not a lot of time, but time to make thoughtful decisions about our future and our budget. The budget I presented you, which the Joint Appropriations Committee passed, was intended to trigger a serious conversation about our future, ways to diversify our economy, and ways to strengthen our state. Wyoming will always depend on our traditional industries, but it must also take advantage of new opportunities. My budget charts a fiscally stable path. It keeps ongoing spending flat, giving our state time to think about the services we need to provide and those we can do without. This budget took the advice of this legislature and funded education in, in an undiminished capacity. In doing so, you all know that we will have to spend for more savings. The valve on education funding is stuck open, and it will be up to this body to think carefully about how long that plumbing will hold out. This is a year when we recalibrate Wyoming's funding model. Accordingly, I recommend that this year we carefully consider Superintendent Bailo's suggestion to review Wyoming's basket of goods. The basket is what Wyoming mandates to be taught in school. It was crafted when Amazon was only a bookstore and the Spice Girls were all the rage. We owe it to our kids and our state to offer a 21st century world-class education. <laughs> My budget proposes curbs on capital construction. I did so noting that we already are engaged in several expansive and expensive projects. The State Hospital, the Life Resource Center, the UW Science Facility, the Skilled Nursing Facility, the Wyoming State Penitentiary, and the Casper State Office Building, to name a few. Given that it's hard for us to afford to pay the people we need to staff these buildings, it makes little sense to continue to build as aggressively as we have when times were more flush. In keeping with this administration's desire for transparency, I want to commend Auditor Racinus and her office for bringing unprecedented transparency to the state's checkbook with her Why Open website. My office has also set up a website, Wyoming Sense. It illustrates Wyoming's budgeting process, and it will track the progress of work this session. Now anyone in Wyoming can easily see what's being budgeted and how it's being spent. It may come as something of a surprise, but state government has actually shrunk now from a decade ago. There are fewer state employees who are being asked to do more with less. They have capably responded by leveraging technology to implement better ways to provide the services our citizens need. To further these efforts, I've endorsed strategic investments in new technology and advanced cybersecurity. We cannot afford, afford to fall behind in this critical area. We must also recognize the value of our workforce. We're losing some of our most skilled and productive and knowledgeable employees because we don't pay competitively. On top of that, we should remember that both employee health insurance and retirement contributions have increased, which effectively reduce take-home pay. Let me sum up this problem. We continually need to train new employees who then become better candidates for positions in other states with better pay scales. This is unacceptably expensive and it is very costly. We should be thinking about keeping the people who know what to do and how to do it. While I understand Wyoming's reluctance to offer permanent salary increases in this revenue climate, I've proposed a one-time bonus aimed at recognizing a talent 
and retaining talent. If we want to reduce government, in my view, we can only do it with motivated people who know how to do their jobs. Rarely has the importance of good employees been more evident than on July 1st last year, when Black Jewel unexpectedly closed down operations at two of Wyoming's largest coal mines. While other states with Black Jewel operations vibrated ineffectively, Wyoming sprang into action. The dedicated, talented, and knowledgeable team at DEQ came in to support mine employees and immediately set about stabilizing the mine. And other agencies started working with our miners to find them jobs, provide them earned benefits, and renegotiate mortgage schedules. Things could have been much worse, and they were elsewhere in coal country. Before moving on, I want to highlight another important and dedicated public employee group of employees, the ones who keep us safe, our first responders. This past year, several highway patrol troopers have been injured. Trooper Jamie Wingard is here with us today. In October, she was investigating a crash on I-25 outside of Wheatland when she was struck from behind on a, by a semi-truck, tearing her seat loose and totaling her car. Thankfully, she was wearing her seatbelt and wasn't significantly harmed. But it is a stark reminder that our first responders, troopers, firefighters, EMTs, and law enforcement folks put their lives on the line every day. Trooper Wingard, for you and on behalf of all law enforcement and first responders, please accept our esteem and appreciation. And by the way, be careful out there. By now, Wyoming citizens know too well how a myopic national political attitude to vilify fossil fuels has affected our energy industry. 28 states have enacted either renewable standards or low carbon policies. These are targeted at the very industries that have helped raise our standard of living, built our schools, funded public infrastructure, and made the U.S. the premier economy in the United States. We produce better energy, more safely, and with more attention to the environment than anywhere else on the planet. And yet our industries are still discriminated against, maligned, and decried as dead. Well, not on my watch. Know this, know this, Wyoming will always advocate for our industries, whether it be to protect against unconstitutional restraints of trade or in their endeavors to deliver cleaner, more dependable, more affordable, and safer energy to our nation. In the gallery is Rod Pipo, the mine manager of Kemmerer Mine. Rod represents the dedicated men and women who go to work every day to see that people, mostly outside of Wyoming, can cool and heat their homes, and that the lights come on when they hit the switch. Rob, I remember the day you showed me the mine's pink haul truck, a tribute to women miners, and a statement to stand up to breast cancer. Your community, your mine, the people who work there are the heart and soul of Wyoming. Rob, know that we respect the work and your fellow miners do every day and that this governor will always have your back.
You see, the problem we face is not burning coal. The problem is that we haven't recognized or seized the opportunities to burn it cleaner, to use its byproducts more beneficially, or remember its role as our country's most reliable source of electricity for over 100 years. We in Wyoming are leading the way. Our university, the Integrated Test Center, and the Carbon Valley in Northeast Wyoming are just part of this singular effort. But we must do more. That is why my administration has taken this fight to the Supreme Court. Oregon, California, and Washington have each sought to extend the reach of environmental regulation beyond their borders to blockade interior states like Wyoming their rightful access to coastal ports. These actions are a blatant, unconstitutional restraint of trade. A few weeks ago, Montana joined us in bringing an original complaint before the Supreme Court to challenge Washington State's arbitrary action against the Millennium Coal Bulk Terminal. The vehicle was a Millennium Port, but the issue is an arbitrary and capricious discrimination against a very useful product. It represents a direct threat, a direct threat to our products, to Wyoming's way of life, and I will defend our state. Thank you, Attorney General Hill and your staff for your meticulous work in crafting a strong original brief before our nation's highest court. On the national stage, I continue to work with our exceptional federal delegation. Congresswoman Cheney, Senator Barrasso, and I especially want to single out and thank retiring Senator Mike Enzi for his yeoman service to the state. To get, hey, hey. Together, we're advocating for legislative and regulatory, regulatory reform of Section 401 of the Clean Water Act. In November, I traveled to Washington, D.C. to support Senator John Barrasso's bill that does just that. State water quality regulation should be about water quality within one state's own boundaries and not used as a weapon by one state to impose its will on another. I have also provided resources to the Public Service Commission to closely examine the assumptions made by various utilities' integrated resource plans. Changes in those plans can impact hundreds of our jobs. It is our duty to verify that the proposed early closure of coal-burning units are truly warranted and economical, not just philosophical and political. Wyoming genuinely welcomes renewable resources like wind and solar. They have a place here. But we will not recklessly abandon our most abundant and reliable energy source just because it's unpopular with some people. Today, I challenge all of us to work together to make sure that the next carbon capture and sequestration facility is built here in Wyoming. I ask for your support of legislation requiring all new electric generation capacity produced in Wyoming to be reliable and consistent, and that a reasonable portion of it be net carbon negative. In doing so, Wyoming will demonstrate what no other state has had the courage to do. We will require true CO2 sequestration, not just some artificial notion that wind and solar can cure climate change all by themselves. I have asked you to add $1 million for coal market augmentation and preservation. This appropriation will be used to defend our energy industry, to sustain the revenues energy provides for the state, and to support local communities' future planning. And I urge you to support a $25 million investment to establish the Energy Commercialization Program. This program will provide a coordinated approach to supporting research to speed along technologies that advance zero or net negative carbon uses for coal and other fossil fuels. I cannot be more emphatic about this point 
Time is of the essence. We must act now if we are to stop coal mines from being closed. Last year, Campbell and Converse counties were rocked by multiple bankruptcies. One in particular came as a shock. Thankfully, there are people in Wyoming who live by the coat of the West. In the gallery is Dan Baker. When his employer abruptly shut down coal, mine, their coal mine, and sent workers home without pay or notice, Dan and others responded. They worked tirelessly to make sure the mines were kept safe, secure, and free from hazards so that his fellow employees would have a workplace to return to at the end of all the legal wrangling in bankruptcy court. Today, I'm happy to say that mine is up and running again. Dan, would you stand so that we may recognize you? As the Black Jewel bankruptcy shows, counties are at risk and should not be left holding an empty bag. Consequently, I'm supporting proposed legislation to change ad valorem tax payments to a monthly basis. Now, I realize this presents a seismic shift for our already financially strapped industries, so the transition must allow long-term dependable industries sufficient time to adjust. Wyoming is a patient place, and we appreciate our industry, but we all pay our debts and expect others to as well. Coal is not the only Wyoming industry that is under stress. I note with particular urgency the state of our natural gas industry. Today, there are only two rigs drilling for natural gas in Wyoming. That's the lowest number in the last 20 years. We've seen bankruptcies and halts in production in this industry too, with equally devastating consequences for local communities. Estimates of natural gas revenue continue to spiral down. I seek the legislature's support in crafting a temporary price-based reduction in severance taxes for those most in need. Wyoming is exceptional when it comes to energy and minerals, we remain the nation's leader in coal and uranium and trona. We're eighth in oil and natural gas production. Even with today's challenges, Wyoming coal supplies 11% of the nation's electricity. In fact, Wyoming is third in overall energy production. And with the addition of wind and solar, we're broadening the portfolio of energy we provide to the nation. Wyoming is known for our natural resources and our public lands. It can, well, it really can be interesting when your largest landholder is the federal government. Our state's relationship with the feds has ebbed and flowed over the years, but thanks to President Trump, right now that relationship is strong and cooperative. With initiatives like shared stewardship, I commit to do my part to keep it that way. We'll work with our federal partners to make sure that the 48% of lands within Wyoming managed by the federal government continue to be accessible for all uses. <laughs> Wyoming cares about our natural resources. We love our mountains, our streams, our lakes, our open spaces, our red desert, and our national parks. We love to hunt and fish, to climb, to bike, to bird, and just to sit out and take in the night sky. Over the past year, we've made significant strides in addressing the challenges and obstacles facing Wyoming lands, wildlife, and waters. In October, I launched the Invasive Species Initiative, where it's establishing better ways to combat the spread of invasive species across our state. Invasives are a universal challenge, not just one that affects our farms and ranches. They infect our public lands and waterways and thus impact wildlife, fire dynamics, tourist operations, and even more. It is imperative that we meet this challenge head on. Wyoming is the first state in the nation 
to tackle the important matter of preserving unique wildlife corridors. National Geographic recently recognized Arthur Middleton and Joe Reese for tracing big game migration routes. Their work shows how crucial these corridors are to preserving our iconic populations. As we have seen in Jonah, developing an oil and gas play is complex. Regulations are important, but they can also impede development. There is a balance to be struck, one that respects landowners' private rights and maintains Wyoming's wildlife and natural resources. My Big Game Migration Corridor Advisory Group did just that. Marissa Taylor is a rancher and a mom from Uinta County, and she is here with us today. As a member of the group, she devoted many days this year listening to and working with other citizens from counties, industry, wildlife, and recreation interests, searching for a sustainable approach to migration corridors. Marissa, it is so good that you are here to do today, and I would like to recognize you. What the group crafted was a recommendation that provides a practical way to identify designate and protect a few migration routes without offending private property rights. Based on their work and my own travels throughout the state, talking to affected stakeholders on all sides, I've drafted an executive order to implement their recommendations. My executive order provides opportunities for area working groups, county commissioners, and others informed by science to provide on the ground tailored recommendations to preserve vital migration routes for two species, mule deer and antelope. It is absolutely not a land grab, nor a way to create hundreds of routes, nor the spaghetti map that some are saying it is. The order simply establishes a way to designate a handful, single digits, of corridors to protect our state's greatest treasures, our wildlife, our hunting, and our opportunity to enjoy the outdoors. Let me tell you why I'm so glad to have, and so proud to have grown up in agriculture. I believe agriculture is the backbone of our state. We will continue to work to expand markets and support this industry across a range of topics. But there is one issue which really came into focus this year. Early on the morning of July 17th, right as the summer was beginning to heat up, an alarm went off indicating that the Goshen Irrigation, Fort Laramie, Garing Canal had lost all water. Goshen Irrigation Canal Tunnel Number 2 had collapsed, shutting off all the flow to 110,000 acres of critical farmland in Wyoming and Nebraska. The water then backed up and blew the canal bank out. As Senator Steinmetz will tell you, it left a hole, the kind you can see from outer space. Rob Poston, district manager, is here with us today to represent the board of Goshen Irrigation District. Now, Rob's a Wyoming guy, so he didn't want to be recognized. He wanted to make sure that other GID staff, Linda Kieran, Andrea Janes, and Kevin Strecker, who all face this daunting challenge together, would be recognized as well. But I want to ask Rob to rise so that we may recognize him and the Goshen Irrigation District for their determination and perseverance. <laughs> Way to go, Rob. You. With the help of many others, including state agencies and our friends in Nebraska, these folks got water flowing again before summer's end, and he just showed me some pictures of how the progress of that tunnel is going on, and believe me, it is amazing. Rob, thank you. Thank you for your perseverance. The GID tunnel failure highlights a larger systematic vulnerability facing our state's aging irrigation infrastructure. 
I personally worked with the Select Water Committee on a solution to this problem. Under the leadership of Chairman Hicks and Larson, the committee passed, I think, a good bill. It's a first step, but let's keep it targeted on irrigation. And I want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to grow the second most significant source of income to our state. Tourism and outdoor recreation in Wyoming represents an enormous opportunity to grow our economy. It's a sector which employs more people and returns substantial sales tax revenue, and that revenue comes mostly from out of state. Whether it's ski joring in the Sundance Winter Carnival this month, skiing in the Tetons or at Hogadon, ice climbing in Cody, snowmobiling in the Bighorns, a ranch vacation in Saratoga, bird watching on the Cokeville Meadows, mountain biking Kurt Gowdy or Johnny behind the rocks, enjoying the daddy of them all right here or rodeo anywhere, almost anywhere in Wyoming, fishing the wedding of the waters or on Glenda, water skiing on the gorge or Alcova, Wyoming truly has a bit of something for everyone. Think about what we can do with Hot Springs National or State Park. And now there's a new military mu museum in Dubois opening in May. I could go on, but you get the idea. Wyoming is an amazing place where you can still get on a river, climb a mountain, or simply enjoy a quiet evening on the plains. I applaud our tourism industry and support its proposal for a lodging tax that would help Wyoming compete with its neighboring states. Over the last year, we've spoken extensively about education, and I've had the pleasure of engaging with educational community all over the state with a variety of issues. I want to recognize Dane Weaver, a passionate teacher of 7th through 12th grade social studies. And Dane is up in the back of the room. He lives in a little town at the base of Ten Sleep Canyon, just over the hill from where I grew up. Dane, please accept our congratulations on being Wyoming's Teacher of the Year. Now I'd like to ask Dr. Neil Theobold, the acting president of UW, to stand so that we can recognize him and the university. It is a tremendous and enduring institution for Wyoming. Just two weeks ago, I sat down with Neil and the presidents of our community colleges. We know that those colleges are so important to our state. Over lunch, we began a discussion about how to better organize Wyoming's post-secondary educational opportunities to be more economic and better able to deliver education where it's needed. And I left that meeting, Neil, very excited about our future and our opportunities. My administration has helped to secure additional financial resources for the year ahead to strategize, evaluate, and improve our early education, K-12 and post-secondary systems. Already we're hearing good things around the state about the strides we are making in workforce development, in particular the Wyoming Works Program and the efforts of the Educational Attainment Executive Council, which has aggressive goals to increase the number of people in Wyoming earning post-secondary certificates and degrees. Through the collaborative, effort, the collaborative efforts of the K-12 education sector, community colleges, UW, and industry, we can equip our students with the necessary skills to ensure their success and improve Wyoming's economic health. This is really good news. We have a window of opportunity in this recalibration year to think critically and in good faith and discuss what we need to teach and how we can sustainably fund our education system. I am committed to working with you to find a solution. That is something we simply cannot afford to put off. This train has arrived at the station, the people of Wyoming know it, and we should not miss it.
My administration is also dedicated to improving access and lowering cost of health care, including prescription drugs. Notably, we need to improve mental health care through innovative approaches and coordinating agency policies for more seamless delivery of services. One area of focus is on the prevention of suicide. This issue struck close to home when I heard from classmates of my own kids who've been struggling with these dark thoughts. Too many of our residents are suffering, and far too many of them are acting. I've supported funding to launch an in-state suicide hotline. It's just a start. We need to work with providers and leverage all our state's resources to do a better job of attending to those in need. My administration is also working on ways to support families and individuals who've been exposed to adversity and trauma. Together, we can create a Wyoming that is healthier, where citizens have quality services for generations to come. Our state is strong. Wyoming truly was forged out of the West by entrepreneurs. It's our history, and it must be our future. I'm anxious to see our state once again become the model where anyone can create wealth from their own enterprise, grit, and work ethic. We're supporting our existing industries by revamping the Business Council. It now has a new mission and a new CEO, Josh Durrell, who just took up the reins. He'll be coming to your community soon. His entrepreneurial private sector experience and deep understanding of Wyoming will be invaluable in helping to support existing businesses, grow new ones, and attract whole new enterprises to this state. And finally, to end where I began with this building, a significant percentage of the 65th legislature has never served in this capital. So I want to take just a moment to remember what it was to be here before the construction began. When I arrived as treasurer in 2012, this place was full of people and energy. Visitors from all over the state and world would be wandering the halls and marveling not so much at the architecture, but at the fact that you could walk into this building and be greeted by and have a conversation with the governor, secretary of state, treasurer, auditor, or a member of the legislature. This simply doesn't happen anywhere else. Over and over again, that's what I heard was the real charm of this place. It was a working capital, the people's house. It's the way government should be, accessible. When the session started, legislators would often stop by our office to discuss legislation or what they hoped to accomplish during the session. The coffee pot was always on. Good work came from the camaraderie that was the hallmark of this capital. This restored building provides the opportunity to continue that culture. There's a great history, there is great history in these walls, but it is not a museum. There's promise and progress and moments ahead as defining as the passage of our Constitution and the recognition of universal suffrage. Like past generations in this building, we too have a rendezvous with destiny but like past generations, it can only be done if we work together. I encourage you to take some time to welcome and engage with visitors. This is the people's house and home of our government. Let's visit one another regularly. My office will always have a coffee pot on and sometimes we'll even have some awesome sweet rolls. <laughs> Let's fill these halls with energy and optimism the energy and optimism that have always been defining moments for Wyoming. God bless you, God bless Wyoming, and God bless the United States of America.
Governor Gordon, on behalf of the members of the Wyoming Legislature, the Speaker and I, uh, we appreciate your remarks today and your words. Thank you very much. Great. Good job. <laughs> the Honorable Chief Justice Mike Davis of the Supreme Court of Wyoming, excuse me, that's a long page, excuse me. I already did that. Members of the 65th Legislatures, uh, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen, I present uh, the Honorable Michael K. Davis, Chief Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court. All right. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, Governor and Mrs. Gordon, members of the 65th Legislature, elected officials, members of the judiciary, guests and citizens of the great state of Wyoming, it is an honor to speak with you today on behalf of the dedicated men and women of Wyoming's judicial branch. It is also quite a privilege to be the first Chief Justice to speak in this beautiful chamber since it has uh, been restored and renovated. Last month, with the help of the Legislative Service Office, the Supreme Court was able to hold an oral argument in the historic Supreme Court room here, which was probably the first time a case had been heard there in over 80 years. It was a memorable day for all concerned. Thank you for that opportunity. Governor Gordon is a tough act to follow, but I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in our branch of government. Our trial courts have been busy administering justice since I spoke to you last. For each of the last five years, there have been at least 150,000 filings in our circuit and district courts combined. Behind every filing is a person or persons, many if not most of them your constituents, and that number seems pretty startling for a state with a population of slightly less than 570,000 people. Most of us don't want to go to court, but crimes must be prosecuted, and everything from the simplest divorce to the most complex civil case must be brought to a conclusion. There are no other places to find justice than in our courts where disputes can be resolved peacefully rather than through violence or self-help. Despite our dipping revenues in Wyoming, the work of the judiciary continues. In fact, it may increase as families are under stress, unemployment and poverty increase, and businesses fail. In Federalist 78, Alexander Hamilton described the judicial branch as the least dangerous branch of government because it has neither the power of the sword nor the power of the purse. That's probably true, but is most certainly not a less important branch of our balanced system of government. A stable and just court system is essential to assure that our state is seen as one in which justice is done. It is well recognized that economies will not attract investors or thrive without assurances of a functional court system. In our Wyoming legal system, 2019 was another year of transitions. Circuit Judges Frank Zebri, sitting in Kemmer, and Randall Arp, sitting in Torrington, retired after years of faithful service. Judge Zebri had served for 35 years as a judge. Truly remarkable. <laughs> they were replaced by Gregory Corp Corpening and Nathaniel Hibben. District Judge Norman Young, sitting in Lander, retired after a long career in public service and his seat was filled by Jason Condor. District Judge Nina James, sitting in Green River, who also had a long career of public service, retired and her seat was filled by Susanna Robinson. We had plenty of good applications for those positions. You know, I can't prove cause and effect, but I'm sure that the judicial pay raise you approved last year helped bring those numbers up. At the very least, 
It reinforced to potential applicants the importance of the judiciary to the public and your branch of government. Thank you. And I would re be remiss if I didn't mention the hard work of the Volunteer Judicial Nominating Commission. The commission had a marathon stint during which just over 14 months it sent 30 names for 10 judicial positions to Governor Meade or Governor Gordon. That literally, literally means thousands of pages of documents had to be reviewed to narrow the field down to the three best of the best. The commissioners deserve our thanks for their selfless, unpaid service. I must also mention that our weighted workload studies show that Wyoming is short as many as four district judges. I understand that you may see separate legislation sponsored by your members that seeks to begin the process of adding two additional judges in two districts this session or in the next. Those are the third judicial district comprised of Sweetwater, Uinta, and Lincoln counties, and the sixth judicial district consisting of Campbell, Crook, and Weston counties. A shortage of judges impacts our branch's ability to provide just, speedy, and cost-effective resolution of disputes, and we support the legislators and district judge efforts to get the help they need. We continue with a number of programs for the benefit of the public and the good of the branch. Our judicial education program for state judges continues under the able direction of Justice Keith Couts and we have begun to offer orientation and training to new municipal judges as well as state judges. Our access to justice program for civil cases, Equal Justice Wyoming, serves thousands of citizens who need legal services and cannot pay for them. And it has been very successful <clears throat> in obtaining and awarding grants to provide that assistance in a number of different and creative ways. The Judicial Learning Center at the Supreme Court building which was funded partly through an appropriation from this body and partly from private donations, has experienced excellent use uh, by educational institutions and the public. In fact, now that this beautiful building is open and attracting students from around the state, we are literally besieged uh, with requests to visit the court and the learning center. And I believe we will shatter all past records this year and in the future. The Court Security Commission which is tasked with making our courts safer for those who must use them, uh, also completed projects in several counties, so we progress on that front as well. In the last legislative session, you passed a law requiring the Supreme Court to set up a chancery court, which will be a specialized business court that will hear certain complex cases not involving jury trial. That project has moved forward briskly under the direction of Justice Kate Fox. She set up a Chancery Court Committee consisting of attorneys who are likely to practice there, judges, Representative Mike Greer, and others. In the time since the legislation became effective, the committee has identified qualified retired district judges who are willing to serve as Chancery Court judges in the time between opening the court and the time it's fully operational, and a permanent Chancery Court judge can be chosen through the usual nonpartisan judicial selection process. The committee also proposed draft rules for the Chancery Court, which the court adopted by the deadline in the legislation you passed, and which are out for further comment by the bench and bar. Lastly, a location for the Chancery Court was approved by the State Building Commission in the new Casper State Office building that the governor mentioned earlier, and plans are underway to construct the courtroom and associated facilities there. As I will shortly discuss, Efforts are also well underway to have a case management and electronic filing system in place when the Chancery Court opens for business so that it is truly a digital court. We thank the members of the Chancery Court Committee and its various subcommittees for all of their hard work. There are many other programs and success stories over the past year, and I would love to talk about them, and I'd be glad to do so if you give me a call or send me an email. But this is a budget session, and I need to address financial issues. A person who for some reason read my address to you last year, who knew anybody did that, 
uh, noted that for a Chief Justice, I sure talked a lot about efforts to make technological advancements, and he was right. And I'm going to have to do it again because that's what the times call for. As I think uh, Governor, Governor Gordon may have indicated uh, to be the case for the executive branch, the times force change upon us as we move deeper into a digital era. It is a time when our citizens, like the citizens of other states, need and deserve digital courts. They are the industry standard. The point is to have an official electronic case record which permits access to court files and electronic filing, electronic notices of proceedings and orders, and tools for managing the docket not to mention statistical information for the use of our branch and the legislature. Digital courts mean increased transparency, efficiency, and ease of use for citizens, lawyers, and judges. As I will explain, our staff has laid the foundation for digital courts, and we are on the cusp of attaining them. The risk of insufficient resources to preserve progress is great, and the cost of any regression or delay will be significant. Let me just tell you about our progress on that front. Although neither our staff nor the elected district court clerks are satisfied with it, we do have electronic district court records on the same system statewide, so we are not dealing with four separate case management systems provided by the counties as we were. We are all on one system. Our district judges and clerks are able to work from digital files rather than yards of unindexed paper files. We are nearly finished with customizing a different program to take the existing system's place and the transition will be easier because we only have one system from which to migrate data. Attorneys have been eager for us to get to electronic filing in district court. This would allow them to file a document in Laramie County from their offices in, say, Cody instantaneously. It would end the ridiculous situation we have now when attorneys print their electronic documents somehow transport them to the court where they are scanned and converted back into an electronic format. The system would automatically immediately notify the other parties of the filing rather than notice coming by snail mail. Attorneys, parties, and judges could work from those electronic files and public access could be as broad or as narrow as this body or the court decided should be. We formed an electronic filing committee consisting of attorneys with experience with e-filing in the Wyoming Supreme Court the federal courts, and the courts of other states. The committee obtained quotes based on national e-filing standards and it set up presentations from three leading national e-filing program vendors. Those vendors set up practice sites so the committee members could experiment with their programs and help select one that we can trust. We also vetted the program with court administrators in other states using them. We will soon make a selection and begin negotiating for electronic filing for the Chancery Court and for all the district courts, probably before the month is out. We thank the e-filing committee for its hard work. The Joint Appropriations Committee has earmarked $2 million for that purchase, and we think it will be sufficient, although we may have to forego some features to get the job done for that amount. Former Senate President Phil Nicholas has also agreed to chair a committee which will identify changes that need to be made to court rules and statutes to make them appropriate to govern e-filing and digital court records. We thank the members of this committee for their willingness to take on this labor-intensive uh, and probably a little mundane but absolutely essential task. I could go on for quite a while about the steps we are taking to move to digital courts. We have a fantastic jury system that provides for electronic completion of juror questionnaires <clears throat> and electronic notification of jurors of trial dates that has been rolled out in about half our courts. This has been good for the people and the courts. As to data security, I would guess most of you have read of uh, recent ransomware attacks in this state and in the region. We have moved branch data, including case records, to the cloud where it is stored in two locations and monitored continuously for attempted cyber attacks. I can't say we would never be hacked, but these steps most assuredly make it much more difficult than it was before. We have upgraded our education and security efforts to comply with the payment card industry data security standards. That's a mouthful. What it means is, is that we have to comply with those in order to be able to take credit cards for traffic fines and other uh, court charges. Interestingly enough, this includes having a consultant hire a firm to try to hack us and tell us if they find any vulnerabilities, among many other things. 
We have also upgraded software and hardware branch-wide, and we have upgraded most courtrooms so that they now have adequate audio systems. Although the video systems in many of those courtrooms, the things used to display exhibits, videos of traffic stops, et cetera, lag behind due to lack of funds. As we approach this budget session, we were privileged to meet with the Joint Appropriations Committee on more than one occasion, and it was suggested that we do a couple of things. One was to figure out all the steps we need to take to accomplish the tasks requested by the legislature or required by the branch to provide adequate court services for our citizens, figure out what they will cost, <coughs> prioritize them, and ask for the money to do what is needed. Second, consider getting a consultant to make sure we are on the right track. Thanks to our highly efficient Chief Information Officer, Julie Cohen, and her staff, we had already done the basic first step of identifying and prioritizing a plan, and we had a pretty good idea about what things cost. So our staff tuned that information up, put it in a graphic form, and responded to requests from the JAC for clarification. Then we put that plan in the form of exception requests and prioritized them in our proposed budget and during exchanges of information with the JAC. But we were met with a certain understandable skepticism. How do our legislators know that we are doing the right things in the right way for our state court system? That's a fair question. Nobody wants to waste money on things that don't work, particularly taxpayers' money. So although I initially hated to spend the money, we hired Justice Management Institute to conduct the suggested review. JMI has done the kind of work we needed in California, Georgia, Louisiana, and for the city of New Orleans, and in the state of Maryland. It has done work internationally in Israel, Abu Dhabi, and Hong Kong. The company came highly recommended. JMI has now reported to us. We have uploaded their lengthy report and a two-page summary to our website. I would guess that all, with all you have to read in your jobs for the next few weeks, you're probably going to want to look at the two-page summary, but everything is there. Here are some of the findings in the report brief they provided. First, the Wyoming Judicial Branch is aligned with and sometimes ahead of peer states, such as Colorado, Montana, South Dakota, and Utah, in achieving digital courts for the benefit of all stakeholders in the courts. Two, the Wyoming Judicial Branch has made this progress with significantly fewer resources, funding, and staff than comparable states. Third, effective and sustainable digital courts require a solid foundation. Thus, the Wyoming Judi Judicial Branch has built an infrastructure and is rolling out applications that can fully support a digital court. Built technologies include a robust case management system, e-citations, e-filing at the Supreme Court, electronic payment of fines and fees, integrated court calendars, and hearings by video conference. As important, over the last two years, the branch has built a new technology infrastructure that is far more secure and adaptable. So, the answer to the question of whether we are on the right track is a resounding yes. Our talented staff is doing the right things in the right way as quickly as it can. The consultants also made a couple of other observations. As already noted, we are understaffed. JMI estimates that we should, based on efforts in comparable states, have an additional eight employees working toward digital courts. We have 18 now. We're not asking uh, for more at this point. Aside from the fact that we wouldn't get them, uh, the consultants noted that our staff, although small, <clears throat> is getting the job done, but more slowly than it could with adequate personnel. And of course, JMI stated the obvious. The branch needs a stable funding source to attain digital courts. I want to thank the Joint Appropriations Committee for all its hard work to understand the rather complex judicial branch budget and the interplay of our work with the various independent district courts and the elected clerks of district court. The latter are actually outside our branch and our county officials. Our funding comes both from the general fund and through special revenue that I will talk about in a moment. And all of its work came as the, J, J, uh, as the JEC was undertaking the Herculean task of balancing the entire state budget in a year in which revenues are far below what is needed and when agencies in the executive branch and even the legislative branch are struggling to maintain operations and progress. 
But here our branch is, poised to get to the digital courts that everyone wants and on the right path and ready to continue moving forward. But complete funding is simply not there due to a downturn in revenue. We may be able to limp along without some critical needs if we already have something in place. A good example is the C-Track electronic filing and case management system at the Wyoming Supreme Court. It has worked well, but it's now 12 years old. It's actually become the most widely used appellate case system in the country. It was the first of its kind in the nation, and it is now so far out of date that it cannot be uh, updated, but would have to be replaced. So, like I did with my old 1971 Datsun B110 I bought with my mustering out.
remarks today. Senator Schuler and Senator Representatives Barlow and Summers, would you please escort the First Lady of Wyoming and the Governor from the chamber? And, uh, Senator, ne and uh, Se Senator Nethercott and Representatives Crank and Nicholas, also would you please escort the Chief Justice from the chamber? Thank you for your attendance.